Hi, this is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey, and I'd like to welcome you to the evening services for January the 23rd, 2022. As we usually do, we'll sing a few songs, we will observe the Lord's Supper, and I will have a message that I hope will be beneficial and uplifting to each one of us. So if you would take your songbooks, we are singing from Songs of Faith and Praise, and turn them to number 96. Nine, six. <coughs> You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praises do, I stand in awe of you. And don't move the page. We're going to number 97. Nine, seven. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, praises to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name, O Lord, Praises to your name, O Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord, glory to your name, O Lord, for your name. Great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name, O Lord. Glory to your name, O Lord. For your name is great and greatly to be And the song before the Lord's Supper is number 770. <clears throat> we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. 770. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclove us in our rightful mind in your lives, thy 
service find in deeper reverence praise O Sabbath rest by Galilee O calm of hills among where Jesus now to share with me the silence of eternity interpreted my love drop thy still dues of quietness till all our striving cease take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thine peace. In the early church, we know that Christians gathered together in their homes, especially very, very early on. And part of what they did was they communed together on uh, literally every level, observing the apostles' teachings. And one of the apostles' teachings uh, uh, encircled uh, the last time that Jesus met with them and uh, in that upper room and they observed the Passover. And it has become what we have uh, 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 termed the Lord's Supper or communion. It got to the point where uh, this was part of the general worship service for in Acts chapter 20 and verse seven. It says that they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. So this is a very, very important part of uh, our service. We know that uh, during our service, we, we pray and we sing praises, some of which we have done already, but uh, maybe the centerpiece or the crowned jewel of what we do is we gather about the, the Lord's table to remember Jesus' death. And so uh, as we uh, commemorate that death uh, in the observance of the Lord's Supper. Uh, let's be as reverent as we possibly can be, understanding what a dynamic moment that was in our lives. Let's give thanks. Thanks for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful that Jesus was willing to give up his body in our stead. We're grateful that he was willing to make that sacrifice so that the sacrifices that were made under the old law would no longer be necessary because the perfect sacrifice had taken place. Bless us as we partake of this bread. We pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our God and Heavenly Father, we know that uh, in and under the old law that uh, uh, blood was part of the sacrifice and it was part of that sacrifice because it represented the life-giving fluid that flowed through animals. Uh, we are grateful that Jesus shed his blood for each of us and it has come uh, down to us as the powerful blood that washes away our sins. Bless us as we partake. Help us to understand how important this is to all of us. 
We pray it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. As a matter of convenience at this time, we think of uh, giving back to the Lord that which we have been blessed. This was also carried out in the New Testament church in the first century. Uh, many times they uh, gathered monies to be sent to other congregations that are in need. And uh, that also can be part of what our giving is all about. Our giving is of benevolence. Our giving is of spreading the gospel throughout the world. Uh, I pray that uh, you would look down on us and help us to be appreciative of those things that we have, that we might be grateful. Let's pray. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to give in the manner that you would have us to give with an open heart in a cheerful way, uh, with gratitude, knowing all the gifts that have come down from on high from you. Bless us as we return that which is your own and help us uh, to do so, knowing that those monies will be used to further your work and help others. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. <coughs> and the last song before our lesson is number 185. 185. Jesus, my name, I love. Oh, oh, oh their names above. Jesus, my Lord. Oh, thou art all to me. Nothing to please I see, nothing apart from me, Jesus, my Lord, thou blessed Son. Of God, God has bought me with thy blood, Jesus, my Lord. How mighty is thy love, all other part of our service and I hope that uh, I hope that uh, we praise the Lord the way we are supposed to and that uh, you joined in with us and you were uplifted by this singing 
If you were there this morning, you heard uh, the title of my lesson, which hopefully whetted your appetite. I try to make the titles uh, a little catchy so that people will uh, just wonder a little bit what I'm going to talk about. And so I let everyone know this morning that the title of uh, the lesson this evening would be Principles from the Precipice. Don't get lost in the peas here. Principles from the Precipice. If you have your Bibles or your devices, if you would turn to the fourth chapter of Luke, and I would kind of challenge you, if you wish to do so, to read Luke uh, chapter 4, verses 14 to 30, as something that you can read and meditate upon uh, to get a fuller meaning of this evening's lesson. And I am going to put all of this in perspective. Since this is early in the book of Luke, we would assume, and rightly so, that uh, this is uh, very, very early in Jesus's life. In the third chapter of the book of Luke, we find that uh, John the Baptist was going about preaching. And in the 21st verse of chapter three, Jesus was baptized by John. And then uh, not too long after that, we know that Jesus, after fasting 40 days, uh, went out and was tempted by Satan. Uh, when that is finished, this brings us to the fourth chapter of uh, the book of Luke. And this marks the very, very beginning of Jesus's ministry. All right, this marks the beginning of Jesus's ministry. Now, uh, Jesus, when he uh, ministered, uh, to uh, the people. If we take a look here in verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee. I get my Bible in front of me so I don't look cockeyed at it. Uh, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And in verse 16, and this is this is very, very important. It says he came to Nazareth. Now we understand that Nazareth is very, very important in the life of Jesus. This is Jesus's hometown. Uh, from the time they uh, left Egypt and, and came back, uh, uh, Nazareth was the place where Jesus and his family lived. Now, interestingly enough, we find out that in uh, verse 21, it says they were all speaking well of him. Isn't that interesting? Now, Jesus is in his own hometown, right? He's in his own hometown. And when he goes into the synagogue, and we have to remember, Jesus was a Jew. He always first went to the synagogue to teach. When he went to the synagogue, he was handed uh, the book uh, and the scroll, and he stood up and he read. And what he read was the book of Isaiah. And in particular, uh, uh, the part of Isaiah uh, that dealt with um, who he actually was. And he read that and he said that uh, this one that was appointed, right? This, this one that was appointed, Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, um, in the passage uh, about who would come, Jesus looked at these people and said, what is uh, prophesied in Isaiah? I stand before you today and fulfill it. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And Jesus said, the one that Isaiah was talking about, you've got him right here in front of you right now. And so as he said that, and he closed the book and he gave it back to, uh, it says back to the attendant, and he sat down and all the eyes were upon him. And he began to say to them, verse 21, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And it says, and all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote, you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard and done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Now, Jesus shares some very interesting things with them now. And let's see how this turns out. He said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows of Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months. When a great famine came over all the land, and let's zero in on verse 26. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. Uh, we know that story. Uh, the widow uh, was going to die with her son because she had only a measure of of grain and a little bit of oil. And Elijah asked her to make a cake for him. And she said, this is all that we have. And, and Elijah explained to her uh, that this is what she was supposed to do. And she did. And because of it, she was blessed for the rest of her life that that, uh, that flour and oil never ran out. And her and her son were able to eat for the rest of their lives. And so we have the widow, not, not a Jewish widow, but a widow from Sidon. And then let's look at the second one. It says, in those days, there were many lepers in Israel at the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. Naaman was the king in Syria and he was a leper. And if we go through all of uh, what took place, he was told to dip his body seven times in the Jordan River. And when he came up the seventh time, his leprosy was healed. Now, you might say, well, isn't this great stuff? But you know what? It was not great stuff for the children of Israel, because you will notice that these Old Testament miracles, these two miracles were not done to Jewish people. They were done to Gentile people. And with that in mind, all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things. And they got up and they drove him out of the city, led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. Wow. He went from a diviner of words to one who could explain the scriptures 
the way no one they had ever known of heard. But just at the mention, just at the mention of these two Gentile people, rose the Jews into turmoil. It says they led him to throw him down, but passing through their midst, he went his way. In other words, they didn't throw him off of that cliff. Jesus had three more years of ministry to complete. This could not happen then. And so, if you remember what I said to you at the beginning, as I explained the title, was principles or lessons from the precipice, right from the very edge of the brow of the cliff. First, Jesus understands us when we deal with fickle people. Now, fickle is not a, uh, a probably 2022 word. Uh, it was probably, I remember it uh, when I was younger. Fickle means to change one's mind quickly. That's what happened to Jesus. I mean, they changed their mind in, in the blink of an eye. He went from being the greatest to being the worst. He went to getting filet from filet mignon to a Big Mac. For goodness sake, how could people be that fickle? They were praising him one minute and they were ready to kill him the next minute. When we speak to people, we should not be shocked when those we are trying to teach go from loving what we say to hating us for what we say. So that's the first lesson, uh, how to deal with fickle people, people who will change their minds quickly. Two, Jesus understands our situation. When people accept what we say, until we say something that goes against what they believe. The Jewish people thought that only Jewish people had the way to God. Why in the world would this man mention miracles taking place with two Gentiles being involved? They were all for him until his teaching uh, while his teaching agreed with their belief. They were angered when he s supported what they were against. That can happen. It can happen to us today by the nature of those who do not love the truth. Prejudice can keep people from believing the truth. People's own built-in uh, beliefs can keep them from understanding and believing the truth. Preconceived ideas can be stronger than the truth we've heard. I'm not going to do that because I've never done that before. And so Jesus understands our situation. Many people don't like information that challenges their core values, that gets them out of their comfort zone, even to the point of the values of their parents or even uh, denominational teachings. Truth seekers need to evaluate everything they hear against what the Bible says. This is what Acts chapter 17, verse 11 tells us. And truth seekers must be willing to give up their preconceived ideas and give up their error, no matter how long they've held that error, because wrong is wrong. If it was wrong yesterday, it's wrong today. And so Jesus understands our situation when we say something that goes against what they believe. Third, 
boy, here's a tough one. Jesus understands what it means to be rejected. Jesus was a human, uh, at least in physical form. He had hair, teeth, blood, bones. You know, he had all the parts that every human had. And he had a human mind and a human psyche. No one likes to be rejected. Rejected, can, being rejected can be one of the most damaging emotional feelings that one can experience. That's the reason many will not talk to others about important truths because they are afraid of being rejected. Jesus was hurt by rejection just as you and I can be hurt by rejection. Remember this, Jesus went into the synagogue. This was where he belonged. It was even the synagogue in his own hometown. He'd probably been going to that synagogue since he was a little boy. There's no record, but it sounds likely that since he was a little boy with his earthly parents, Joseph and Mary, and with his, his family, that he attended that synagogue. And so they did not just reject his ideas. They were real, willing to reject him to the point that they were so upset that they wanted to kill him. And so Jesus understands our situation when we're rejected. Fourth, let's take this rejection one step further. Jesus knew what it was like to be rejected by his family. In the beginning, according to uh, John chapter 7 and verse 5 and Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, even his brothers did not believe that he was the Messiah. Now, understood, they came around later on. But the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 16, said that anyone who blasphemed was to be killed. And I believe that the people here, in that Jesus mentioned these Gentiles in miracles done by Elijah and Elisha, were blasphemous. And that would have included his brothers. Nothing there says. And by the way, his brothers may have been in attendance in that synagogue when Jesus talked to these people. And there's nothing there that says, oh, his brothers jumped up and said, whoa, 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 don't this, do this to Jesus. You know, maybe he's messed up a little bit, but you know what? He's, he's our brother. We don't want to see him die, dead. Um, Jesus knew about this. And so in Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 37, he said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This does not mean that Jesus uh, wants the sword more than peace, because Jesus was a person of peace. But he is not willing to sacrifice peace at the risk of sacrificing the truth. Lastly, <laughs> Jesus knows that sometimes we have to escape. This was what Jesus did when they were about to throw him over the cliff. In Luke chapter 4, verse 30, it says, but passing through their midst, some way or another, he was able to go through their midst and went his own way. Sometimes it is necessary when things are just not going right to do what Jesus said to uh, his disciples when he sent him on the limited commission. He inferred, there are people who will not believe you. There are people who will not listen to you. Shake the dust off your feet and go to where you have to go to next. Very often, Jesus felt the need to get off by himself, 
to just escape from the humdrum of the world and just talk to the Father. And we must also do that from time to time. Escape from the uh, what is going on in the world so that we can be with the Father who is in heaven. You know, there are great lessons to be learned for us in the principles from the precipice. This is what we get from that. So I would challenge you to go ahead and read Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 30. Uh, assimilate it, meditate upon it, and think of the five lessons that I shared with you as to how these can affect us and the way we deal with people. Because we're the great evangelists of the world. We're the ones that are to go into all the world and preach the good news. And understand, it won't always be accepted the way we would like it to be accepted. And we need to understand that there are lessons and there are principles to get from the precipice. If you are listening this evening, you haven't come to the Lord as yet, we offer you the invitation to become a Christian. If you know and have studied and know that you must confess Jesus as the Son of God and be baptized for the remission of your sins, uh, we want to help you with that. If you've come to that decision this evening, get in touch with one of us and we will be there. As we close, let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the time that we've had together this evening. I pray that uh, what we've said, uh, the songs, uh, the observance of the Lord's Supper, we just pray that this has been pleasing in your sight and uh, we just pray, dear Heavenly Father, that despite whatever happens, we must stand for the truth, just as Jesus stood for the truth. People won't always accept it. People always won't accept us, and perhaps they'll even border on rejecting us. Help us to be firm in what we believe. Help us to understand that the truth is the truth. And if any are going to live with you eternally, they must adhere to that truth uh, that is found in your word. Bless us this evening. Be with us and, and help us as we uh, retire for the evening to um, think of you and to think of how important you are in our lives and be willing to share you with others. Bless us. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on Oh! Uh -huh.
people, princes, greatest judges all. Praise His name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise His name, Jehovah.